On April 8th, there will be a total eclipse traveling across North and Central America in what will be the astronomical event of the year. So today we're talking to Stephen Wolfram, a prominent scientist and computation pioneer, to find out how they calculate where and when these events occur. Have you ever seen an eclipse before? Send us your stories via our social media pages at Space of Things Podcast on Threads, Instagram, and Facebook, or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us on patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, it's time for episode 188 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carty and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. Welcome to episode 188 of our podcast. How you doing, Emily? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How you doing, Dave? I'm good. I have some good news for you, Emily. Oh, okay. What is this good news? I'm excited. What's the, what is it? So we are 12 episodes away from show 200, and we have 104 Patreon subscribers. Oh my God, that is wonderful. That is not good news. That is spectacular news. news. Exactly. That is awesome. That's Yeah, that's not good news. That's awesome news. Oh my God, that's wonderful. So yep, me and Dave get to Looks like they're stuck with us for a little bit longer. (laughs) Yeah, looks like y'all are... Yeah, some of you might be happy about this. Some of you might be happy about this. Some of you might not, but that's okay. Either way, you're stuck with us for a while. So that is so cool. Uh, God, I feel like I'm at an award ceremony or something. Uh, (laughs) Seriously, thank you everyone who supported and helped us out with this endeavor. Um, We're an independent podcast. Uh, We're not backed by a huge production company, so it makes it a little harder for us to stand out against all the other podcasts, I would say, because there's a lot of great other science and space podcasts out there as well. So, but uh, with your support, this really is awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, for the, for those who maybe this is their first episode they've ever listened to, uh, Emily and I have, show 150, we said we would carry on past episode 200 if we reach 100 Patreons. At the time, I think we were on about 60, and uh, and people have, have risen to the, the challenge and helped us out, and, and we've got there. Of course, we, we appreciate anyone who helps us out financially, whether by merchandise or donating or however you want to do it. Um, You don't have to. Podcasts are free. It's an amazing thing. But that is the only way we can earn anything from doing this is is from Patreon and merchandise and donations. So anyone who's ever done that is is amazing. And we do put a lot of time into it. So we don't mind doing it, but there just comes a point where... uh, you have to say, should I be spending two full days on on a podcast when I'm not earning yeah. anything? So that was that was that was the logic. When we've been doing it for four years, it kind of makes yeah. sense. This is a part time job for us. Exactly. <laughs> this is a part time exactly. job. So, yeah, thank you to everyone. Of course, we need to try and maintain it. I'm very aware those who have signed up may want to leave. They may not be able to carry on uh, at various points, or, or may not want to. So. Uh, now you know we're sticking around. Maybe that's stopped some people wanting to sign up, thinking, "Well, if they're gonna, if they're gonna stop, well, why would I? Why would I sign up?" Well, now we've got there. Maybe that would make you want to come and join us over there. There are various perks you get from signing up. So head over to patreon.com forward slash space and things if you want to join. But we'll we'll perhaps not mention it quite so much now for a few weeks, yes. <laughs> uh, just to give you all a break from us um, constantly trying to trying to promote that but but yes thank you to everyone who's signed up and everyone who's been some people have been signed up since day one and uh that that's many months now of supporting us so thank you very much yes thank you so much right let's crack on with this week's main feature on april 8th 2024 a total solar eclipse will travel across mexico the united states and canada creating what is called a path of totality That sounds fun. A solar (laughs) eclipse is when the moon blocks the sun while it passes between the sun and the earth. If the weather is good, those uh, in the area of the totality may be able to see the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, I believe that's called, uh, also a a not-too-bad Mexican beer, and experience (laughs) uh, also a virus, which none of us want. Anyway, and experience some other (laughs) crazy phenomena associated with eclipses. Now, those of you who are able to witness this Please do make sure that you take the correct precautions and ensure you don't damage your eyes while viewing the event. I'll be putting a link in the show notes to a NASA page to explain what you need to do. So 
go and have a look. It also has a map of exactly where the eclipse will be. So you can see without traveling whether you're going to see it. it. might just be a partial where you are. You might be in the area of totality. Anyway, check that link out. It is in the show notes. We're aware that many people will travel to see this event. Uh, eclipses are rare events and they're pretty special too. However, we're also aware that many of our listeners are not in North or Central America. So we wanted to make our eclipse chat a little less specific. And with that in mind, we're talking to Stephen Wolfram, an extremely famous scientist and computation pioneer who earlier this year released a book called Predicting the Eclipse, a Multi-Millennium Tale of Computation. Yeah, Wolfram is an award-winning scientist and best-selling author and creator of some of the world's most respected software systems such as Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Language. For more than 35 years, he has been the CEO of the global technology company Warframe Research, as well as responsible for a series of groundbreaking advances in basic science, including the recent Warframe Physics Project. I think uh, it's fairly obvious to see where he gets his inspiration for the names of his various things. Anyway, this is a truly fascinating interview, so we really hope you enjoy it. Houston, this is Space and Things Space here. It's time. To crack on. Welcome, Stephen, to our podcast. Your newest book, Predicting the Eclipse, a multi-millennium tale of computation, delves into the history behind predicting eclipses. So have eclipses in space, have they always been something you've been interested in, or was it solely the mathematics which drew you into the subject? Oh, I was interested in space. I was growing up in England in the 1960s. Space was the, the big vision of the future back in those days. Fortunately, in a sense, I went from being interested in space to being interested in physics, to figuring out how to use computers to do things and so on, because there was sort of a 50-year hiatus when space wouldn't have been the happening thing. It's back again now, which is cool to see. Mm -hmm. But yes, I was, I was interested in those things from a long time ago. And in fact, I, uh, I saw my first partial solar eclipse when I was six years old. And of course, because wow. we can say when eclipses happen... I know exactly which day that occurred. <laughs> I could uh, go back and um, just recently, I went back and sort of figured out exactly what did I see exactly when, when I was six years old, walking to school and noticing this funny phenomenon in eclipses, which is, you know, when you look at the dappled pattern of light under a tree, normally it's just little blotches of light. But when there's a partial eclipse, every blotch of light has a little bite taken out of it, which... Yep. The six-year-old me was very excited to have noticed. Okay, that's, that's a great start. So um, one of our pa Patreon subscribers is called John Wolfram, and he assures me that he's not related to you, but he has sent in a, a question, <laughs> which I think is a good one to start with. When was the first time humans accurately predicted a total solar eclipse? Right. I think decently accurate. So it's been getting more and more accurate. We were very proud in the 2017 eclipse that we could predict it to within one second and we weren't sure we were going to get it right, but it turns out it, it was right to within one second. <laughs> wow. Doing it beyond one second is quite difficult for reasons we can explain. But in terms of sort of roughly when is it going to happen, it got progressively better. I, I think the first time people were saying there's going to be an eclipse, it's really going to happen, 1600s, I think, was probably the time when, when people were reasonably confident. Now, back... In antiquity, people had observed eclipses. Of course, the typical person back in antiquity, not knowing when eclipses were going to happen or where, will never have seen more than one eclipse in their lifetime. In other mm -hmm. words, somebody saw the sun went out for a few minutes and, oh my gosh, what is this? But it isn't like they would have seen that again. The, the Babylonians, uh, over a period of about 700 years, did this really cool thing, which was they recorded their astronomical diaries every day. They would write down what planets are where in the sky, well, what's the weather like, what's the price of grain, <laughs> and when there was an eclipse, they would record it. And they did that for 700 years. And then people were able to look at that, all that data, and people like Hipparchus, but more so Ptolemy in first century AD, were able to, to really look at that and say, what can we see about the pattern when eclipses occur? And they knew, I mean, Ptolemy, for example, knew the geometry of eclipses. He kind of had the idea, he had the idea that the 
the sun goes around the earth, but he still had the notion of the geometry as the moon is going in front of the sun and that's what's causing the eclipse. And he had, uh, from that Babylonian data, he had quite a lot of information on when eclipses happened. And they noticed that there were these cycles of eclipses. Uh, one that they noticed in that time was the uh, Soros cycle, which is an 18 year cycle of when eclipses can happen. It's not guaranteed that if an eclipse happens, then 18 years later, there can be another eclipse. Often there isn't, but there can be another eclipse. They, they knew that. And I think the working out of eclipses got better. And by the time we're in the 1600s, people like Tycho Brahe and, and then later uh, Kepler had, had pretty good kind of geometrical information that suggested when eclipses could happen. Uh, well, like Isaac Newton, for example, who thought he had a theory or you know, had a universal law of gravitation, had theory for laws of mechanics. He said, okay, we've got all this stuff. We're going to nail down when an eclipse is going to happen. Uh, he was particularly interested in the, in the position of the moon in the sky because it was hoped that that could be used for navigation. Um, but it could only be used for navigation if you could really predict its position accurately. And, and Newton tried to do this and didn't actually manage to get it quite right. But he has a nice, he has a little booklet he put out in, I think, 1705 maybe. And uh, Newton sort of claimed he'd nailed it down. He hadn't really nailed it down. It took another, <laughs> oh, 150 years or so. By the, the, the time when one could really start to seriously accurately predict eclipses was probably late 1800s and uh, then rolling into the beginning of the 20th century. And by the time it was 1920s and so on, it was, it was pretty established. And, and there was, I think, an eclipse in 1929 in that uh, went across New York City. And the sort of the big question was, which block in New York City would be in total eclipse? <laughs> and it wasn't quite right, but it was pretty close. When we think of a computer now, we often think of the laptops and the smartphones at our fingertips. Very um, micronized technology. However, that word used to have really different meanings. Uh, usually there was rudimentary equipment or even human computers. So tell us a little bit how early computers helped to predict eclipses. The very first computer we know is a mechanical computer that came from 2000 years ago. There's just one example of this. There have to have been lot, a lot more that exist in antiquity, but we just haven't found them. Around 1900, some divers, sponge divers off, a, off an island called Antikythera, Greek island, found a shipwreck. And they found a bunch of stuff in the shipwreck. A bunch of well-known kind of artifacts from antiquity came from that shipwreck, including this lump of gunk. And the <laughs> lump of gunk wound up in the Athens Museum, and it sat there for, for 50 years, basically. And sometime in the 1950s, somebody dropped the lump of gunk, and it broke. And at the, at the break where it broke, they saw cogs sticking out. Oh, wow. Which is pretty dramatic because it's just a lump of, you know, corroded metal or whatever, cogs sticking out. What the heck was this thing? Fortunately, nobody tried to take it apart at that time. Later on, it was CT scanned. And over the course of, oh, it must have been in the 1990s, I guess this happened. It was kind of decoded what this thing actually was. It was a mechanical computer made with essentially clockwork, a bunch of cogs and so on. What did the mechanical computer do? It predicted the positions of the sun and moon, and it knew about things like the Soros cycle of eclipses. And so it was, it was set up to be a, uh, you know, it was an astronomical computational device, which could tell you, for example, when it is conceivable that an eclipse could happen. It's labeled with some things that make it seem like it probably came from Syracuse in, in Sicily, uh, in the Greek colony there. And one of the notable members of that Greek colony is Archimedes. And I've, I've sort wow. of had this uh, kind of whimsical thought that Archimedes' business might have been the production of mechanical computers to compute astronomical kinds of things. I, this sort of appeals to me <laughs> because my own sort of life, I, I spent my life building technology to do computations of various kinds particularly things like mathematical computations and the idea that Archimedes was in the same business that I'd been in yeah. is kind of charming to me. But yeah. I don't know if it's true. So anyway, <laughs> that, that's the very first example. Then the next kind of time when computers show up 
is the 1600s. Very known one from 1642 was Pascal made a, a mechanical computer for doing arithmetic. But actually, there was a precursor to that, a person called Chicard, who was a friend of, of, of Kepler's. And he made a computer. Unfortunately, his computer was made of wood. And so wooden things don't last that well. Pascal's was made of metal, so it still exists. Um, Chicard's computer was made uh, basically for Kepler as a, as a device for doing astronomical computations. Um, we don't know a lot about it. Then a lot of what got done after Newton, for example, and the invention of calculus, it was let's use math and things like calculus to do these predictions. And it wasn't so much of a, uh, a computer computation kind of thing. The algebra that was necessary got incredibly elaborate. By the 1800s, there were calculations being done. The Lorni, for example, was one person who did a calculation, which is a whole book of algebra. It's, <laughs> you know, the position of the moon wow. is determined by this formula that is a whole book of algebra, basically. <laughs> he didn't get it quite right, which is kind of a downer. By the 1960s, that algebra could be done automatically by a computer, and errors were found in it. But that was that tradition. And then by the beginning of the 20th century, a chap called Brown, British chap who moved to the US, he'd worked in, in England, he'd actually worked with a person, George Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's son, who was a physicist, who was uh, famous for having come up with a theory for the, for the creation of the moon, not the theory we have today, but a theory for the creation of the moon. And so these guys were working on, can we make tables? to predict the position of the moon. How did you work out the actual position of the moon from these tables? You would use a mechanical computer. Uh, actually, IBM was sort of the, an entity that got into the business of making, uh, they, they sort of set up a, a scientific computing lab in New York City, actually, whose purpose was to compute more tables for the position of the moon. Wow. And that was, uh, was kind of how, at that point, mechanical computers got into the picture. Electronic computers, got into the picture in the 1960s. The big driver for that was the Apollo program, because you know, you're going to send a spacecraft to the moon, you better know where the moon is, yeah. or you're going to miss. That was the time when there was sort of this effort to automate doing these calculations, these algebraic comp calculations, automate doing that. There was also a different method of calculating things, which was directly solving the equations for the position of the moon, the thing that Newton had tried to do. Newton had worked out the equations, but Newton couldn't solve the equations. That was just something, actually, as Newton put it, talking about kind of, can you, if you, if you know the equations that describe the positions of the planets, can you then just work out where the planet's going to be? He had a nice quote where he says, uh, you know, I think to do that exceeds the force of any human mind. Huh. Well, eventually we have computers and computers, uh, manage to exceed the force of any human mind, so to speak, and they can actually solve these equations and do things like predict the position of the moon. Remember, the 1960s, in the history of computing, the first electronic computers were 1946, give or take, the ENIAC. Um, by, the, by the late 1950s, there were starting to be tens of computers and so on, and they were being used in you know, large companies, government organizations, things like this. By the beginning of the 1960s, most large organizations would somehow have a mainframe computer. Uh, and the space program was, a, was, was one place where that happened. Now, having said that, there were still manual calculations being done. I mean, yeah. there were not only computers spelt with an ER at the end, but also computers spelt with an OR at the end, who were humans who were doing these calculations. I think in the Mercury program, for example, it was still primarily human computers, not electronic computers that were, that were doing the calculations. All right. So the book discusses, and you've touched on this a lot so far in our conversation, but the book discusses how some of the legends of math and physics, such as, you know, you mentioned Archimedes and Newton, for example, uh, developed ways to better predict astronomical phenomena, such as eclipses. So what might be your favorite story in the book discussing that? I think perhaps a favorite story from the history of science is Newton's efforts to predict the position of the moon and the motion of the moon. Newton 
was really the person who brought mathematics in a serious way into physics. Uh, Galileo had started, started doing that. Newton really filled in the mathematical detail of how that would work. When one makes kind of big theories about how the world works, there's always the question of, is it right? I myself have, have ended up with sort of big theories about how physics is put together. And you always ask yourself, is it right? And people say, well, you know, you do an experiment and you see if the experiment agrees with what you predict and so on. Well, so it's interesting sort of historically that, that Newton sort of had the opportunity to do that. He did it with comets, Halley's Comet in particular. It worked really well for Halley's Comet. He did it with the moon and he does this whole calculation. He has, in, in the way his book, the Principia Mathematica, his big book from 1687, uh, with the full title of which is kind of revealing it's, it's the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. So kind of natural philosophy was the name at the time of physics. And what Newton was doing, he was saying there are going to be mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Before that, people had just imagined there were kind of philosophical principles of natural philosophy. You know, Aristotle had said things fall to the ground because they sort of want to be closer to the center of the earth or something. Uh, it's rather than there is a mathematical uh, set of principles that describe how things move. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that was kind of Newton's idea. So one of his propositions is we can compute the position of the moon. That's, he just says, you know, proposition, some number, these methods that I have described will be sufficient to compute the position of the moon. And then he proceeds to try and do it. And he has this whole long calculation. And at the end, he has just one sentence. He says, but the apse of the moon is twice as swift. In other words, he got the wrong answer <laughs> by a factor of two. <laughs> and what's interesting is that to some, that might have been, so then the theory is wrong. You got the wrong answer. But the, the kind of the, the arc of scientific history was sort of enough that was got right, particularly about things like comets, that people kind of ignored that. Uh, and the other, the other question is, why did Newton get it wrong? Did he make a mistake? Or was it that the sort of mathematical apparatus hadn't been constructed? Really, mostly it was that the mathematical apparatus hadn't been constructed. See, see the thing is, when you're looking at the motion of a, a single planet around a star, idealized motion of a single planet around a star, that's something that's quite easy to work out mathematically. The result is it moves in an ellipse, and you can use sort of basic calculus to figure out the details of that. All works fine. The two-body problem is very solvable. That's what Newton did. But now, for the position of the moon, it really is a three-body problem because there's the Earth, the moon, and the sun. They're all important. And, and so now it's the question of how do three bodies move under gravity? That problem is really hard. And that problem was sort of the key problem of mathematical physics throughout the 1800s. For Newton, sort of the mathematics didn't get quite unraveled. Although, as I mentioned, Newton, I think it was 1705, produced a little booklet that sort of claimed to, to compute the position of the moon. It's not completely clear how he did it. In those days, there was a lot of uh, uh, sort of, you know, I have got this great method for computing this thing, and I'm not going to tell you how it works. I mean, honestly. It's the same today, but people present these things a little differently, but, but it's the same, same, same idea. But the three-body problem, it's remarkable how complicated it is. You compute you know, with, for example, our technology, you can compute nicely the kind of trajectories of three bodies that are attracting each other with gravity. And you might think, oh, they'll just be, uh, it'll be very simple. But actually, no, it looks like a big scribble on the page. And you know, these things move around in very complicated ways. Maybe in the end it will resolve into, oh, there's just two things orbiting each other and another one gets ejected. But often, at least for a long time, there'll be this complicated kind of scribble of motion. And working that out is really hard. In fact, it's my guess that the problem of, for example, what will happen to the three bodies in the end? Will they all escape separately? Will two of them orbit each other and one escape? Or what will happen? That that problem is kind of computationally, fundamentally intractable. That there's no way to work out the answer, except by essentially running the explicit computation, simulating what will happen. 
So it's 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 sort of a, a fundamentally unsolvable problem. So a good a good follow up to that. One of our Patreon subscribers, John Wisenhunt, has sent this question, and he said, "Total solar eclipses have a profound place in human culture, and have done over the millennia." Did you find any surprising misconceptions or superstitions that still seem to affect the eclipse experience? You know, I would have assumed there would have been more sort of superstition about the end of the world, it's an eclipse and so on, than there actually were. And I think the, the, the reason for that is they happen very rarely. Mm. And so, you know, back in ancient times, any given person it's exceptionally unlikely to have seen more than one eclipse in their lifetime. But yeah, it, it is a bit surprising actually that there aren't more kind of, you know, Mayan stories of, you know, the end of the world and things like this associated with eclipses. But I think the point is that if you say the end of the world's coming, there's going to be an eclipse, you have to know when the eclipse is going to happen, point one. And point two, if they're that rare, it's just not something that that a lot gets built around. I, I'm also a little bit surprised that partial eclipses, which are much more common, I don't know of too much sort of superstition and, you know, in the Middle Ages, people were fond of coming up with all kinds of sort of conspiracy-ish theories for the way that, that nature works and so on. And I, I don't know of too many uh, about, about eclipses uh, along those lines. I think it's, um, uh, I, I mean, I have to say, you know, the, the couple of total eclipses that I've seen, one, one sort of feels the smallness of human history, I suppose, realizing that, you know, this phenomenon is, you know, it's inexorably happening. It's nothing to do with humans. These eclipses were were happening millions of years ago. The dinosaurs will have seen them. Actually, they will have seen them more easily than we do because the moon was closer to the earth at that time than it is today. Watch the eclipses while you can. In another 100 million years, there won't be, uh, there won't be total eclipses because the moon will move further away from the earth. And oh, yeah. um, it will no longer be able to fully block the disk of the sun. Wow. Um, probably a lot of other things will have happened in a hundred wow. million years as well, yeah. but um, uh, but that's one of the one of the things. It's to me at least, it's it's sort of just a reminder of the insignificance of human history that this is something that's been sort of inexorably going on throughout time. I mean, even you know the eclipse that's coming up right now is part of a series that started in 1500, and uh, it's uh, there's this 18 year sequence, and where eclipses can happen. And they happen at different places on the Earth. They usually scan across the surface of the Earth. This one started in 1500, and I think this particular series will end in 2700. Wow. We are seeing sort of partway through that series, this particular eclipse, where the shadow of the moon happens to cross the US. So a bunch of people get to, get to see it, so to speak. Right, we got um, an, another question. This is from Don Irwin. He says, During Apollo 12, the astronauts experienced a solar eclipse when the Earth came between them and the sun. What is different about understanding an eclipse from somewhere other than the surface of the Earth? Presumably, one can determine eclipses or transits among other bodies in the solar system as well. Absolutely. I mean, one knows that very well. I mean, what's happening in an eclipse? The moon's going around the Earth, and uh, the, you would think that every lunar month, the moon should get between the earth and the sun. It doesn't. The reason is that the moon is tipped at a five degree angle relative to the plane in which the earth orbits the sun. And that presumably the moon, when it was formed from the big splat or whatever, it got <laughs> that extra little, little tilt. And the reason that we see eclipses so rarely is things have to line up exactly with the moon being between the earth and the sun. The moon is is somewhere between the Earth and the Sun every lunar month, every 28 days or so. But most of the time, it's, it's tipped far enough away that it doesn't obscure the Sun. It's only when it happens to be both lined up in its height relative to the plane in which the Earth orbits the Sun and in the position between the Earth and the Sun that you get an eclipse. Yeah. So, so we, are, we kind of have a bad deal in terms of eclipses. If you lived on Jupiter, Ganymede, for example, Every single time it orbits Jupiter every few weeks, uh, we'll make an eclipse. Now, again, it's a question of what's the relative size of Ganymede seen from the surface of well, Jupiter doesn't have an ordinary surface, but seen from the top of the atmosphere of Jupiter. What's the size of Ganymede relative to the size of the sun? Jupiter is much further away from the sun, so the sun is much smaller, but Ganymede firmly covers the sun from Jupiter. From Mars, for example, Phobos and Deimos, every Phobos month or whatever, it will be in front of the sun, but it's really small. 
compared to yeah. the disk of the sun, even though the disk of the sun is smaller from Mars. So you don't get to see an actual eclipse there. But the, um, yeah, w so we actually have it pretty bad on the Earth in terms of not getting to see so many eclipses. From spacecraft, well, I mean, w the, you know, in terms of other things like eclipses, like transits of Venus, transits of Mercury, those planets going in front of the sun viewed from Earth, you know, that's a, it's a tiny speck on the disk of the sun viewed from the Earth. So it's a question of these sort of relative sizes. On the surface of the Earth, we have a coordinate system. We have latitude and longitude. It tells us where we are on the surface of the Earth. If you're in space, figuring out where you are is much more complicated. Uh, for example, in, in, in working out eclipses and predicting eclipses, one of the trickier pieces has to do with figuring out exactly where you are on the surface of the Earth. The Earth is rotating, and you, these things called the Basilian elements, which describe kind of how the cone of shadow from the moon intersects the Earth, and it's kind of geometrically complicated. Okay, so, so the final, one of the final issues in predicting when will the eclipse arrive to the second is knowing how much has the Earth rotated by what time. Mm. And, you know, we say, well, the Earth spins on its axis once a day. How long is a day? At this moment in physical time, what date is that? Yeah. And the thing is that in a first approximation, we might say, oh, it's February 28th. But no, that doesn't quite work. And we know we have a, every leap year, we have to add a February 29th and so on. In the end, we're adding leap seconds. So for example, since people started adding and subtracting leap seconds, I think there's uh, maybe 27 leap seconds have been added since 1970 or so. There hasn't been a leap second in a few years now. But the question of when there are leap seconds, that's determined by, by when does the rotation of the Earth slightly glitch? <laughs> and that, those glitches happen because of earthquakes. They happen because of things about glaciation and so on. It's a very tricky business. And to know when the eclipse is going to arrive to the second, you know, you, you have to compare, okay, the earth has to be at this orientation, but what time will it say on my watch at the time when the earth is at that orientation? So that's, that's one of the effects. When you're working this out in the solar system, it's much more complicated because the, you say we have latitude and longitude on the earth. Okay. You want to say, I am somewhere near between the earth and the moon. Where am I exactly? Yeah. You can't like, you know, look up your GPS and have it tell you you're at this latitude and that longitude. Um, there is a different way of describing coordinates, and there are several coordinate systems you can use to describe the solar system. They usually, most common ones, refer to either the center of the sun or the so-called Barry center of the solar system, the center of gravity of the solar system, center of mass of the solar system. But it's really tricky. And uh, okay, to make it even more tricky, you have to deal with the speed of light and relativity. So if you say, uh, you know, we're going to have a big celebration at noon on Mars, the question is, when is that relative to <laughs> noon on Earth? It might yeah. take like 20 minutes to get from Mars to the Earth. So defining when is noon on Mars um, is a tricky thing because it's like <laughs> noon on Earth happened. Okay, we send a light signal. Now we think noon on Mars is happening, or do we try and correct for that and say, so this is, this is the story of relativity, and this is the story of reference frames and simultaneity and so on. But all of that stuff you have to take into account if you're trying to say, you know, is this eclipse going to happen at this place in space, at this time? You know, what do you mean by the time? Because yeah. the time's going to be off by, <laughs> by hours if you go into the outer solar system. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty tricky business. And I mean, clearly... If we were saying, well, there's an eclipse of this star by that star, and these stars are, you know, 10 light years away, we will describe it very egocentrically, so to speak, or human centrically in terms of the time at Earth. But that's not the time where it was happening, so to speak. You know, the moon is only a light second or something away. But when humans venture further away, there is a good question of, of what's going to be the time zone. I mean, for for planes and ships and so on, it's always Greenwich Mean Time on the Earth. But that doesn't have to deal with the relativistic, you know, the speed of light problem. That's just defining, you know, the convention for what time zone you're in. That's deep. So your book also has tables for future eclipses, maps for this year's event, and an appendix on eclipse computation. So eclipse watchers can compute them to the last second. So where do you plan on watching this year's eclipse? I'm planning to be in Austin, Texas. At least that's my theory. 
Um, <laughs> I seem to have been trained and lots of other people to come watch it in the same place. And I'm a little bit, uh, the weather isn't, isn't so great necessarily. And it would be a shame to only see the eclipse through clouds. The, the two eclipses I've seen are the 1991 eclipse, which is the longest one in the century. Um, I saw from uh, uh, somewhere in Mexico and uh, the um, 2017 eclipse I saw from uh, Wyoming. Um, I have to say the one in Mexico, I, I do have to tell a little bit of a funny story. I mean, I was, uh, it was kind of, um, uh, you know, let's go down to someplace in Mexico, see this. So I charter a plane take a bunch of people down there, um, friends of mine, and uh, we're, we're there. We get to this lovely beach, nobody else there, wonderful place to see an eclipse. And, you know, we have all these tables about when the eclipse is coming. And then I realized, here we are, a bunch of kind of techie people sitting on a beach in Mexico, and nobody has an accurate timekeeping device. And, you know, <laughs> smartphones weren't yet a thing, obviously, in 1991. The most accurate way to know what the time is, I have maps of the eclipse. <laughs> now, by 2017, you know, we had this website that could predict to the second when the eclipse was going to come, and everybody could tell if we were right because everybody had their smartphone, smart yeah. and their smartphone is, is, uh, has the time. Well, it's actually it's synchronized to the internet, uh, global time of the internet. Um, once the internet extends to other planets, that will be a more complicated story. <laughs> yeah. But here on Earth, <laughs> the light travel time is small enough that we can have a global internet time, so to speak. Yeah. So that's that's my my plan. We'll have to see. I'm I'm um, I still have to prep, understanding the weather and so on, and uh, figuring out can I drive faster than the weather or fly faster than the weather, so to speak. Um, it's kind of a shame that you know the eclipse, the the track of an eclipse. Not sure about this one. I could work this out. The the one in Wyoming was going at 1,800 miles an hour across the surface of the Earth. Wow! So you can't, um, uh, you know, back back when the Concorde was still a thing, the Concorde went, I think, up to well, 100 miles an hour, maybe. Um, and uh, you could you could I think in, in some parts of the Earth, depending on exactly where you are, and this is this is a, this is a complicated, you know. This, the, you have to kind of work out the motion of the Earth, the motion of the eclipse. Most of that speed of the eclipse running across the surface of the Earth, most of that is the motion of the Moon. Most of that is not. It's about, I think, two-thirds the motion of the Moon, one-third the rotation of the Earth. That uh, makes, the, makes the eclipse shadow sweep across the Earth. But um, I don't know whether this eclipse is chaseable by any plane that exists today. I'm, I'm thinking it's at best marginal. Maybe there's a military plane that can, uh, that can chase it, so to speak. Wow, that would be fun. So, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been very insightful. I've learned a hell of a lot, and I've now go away with that question ringing in my ears, what the hell is time? Um, because uh, I, I, know, I've, I know I've heard it before, but when you hear someone say it again, it just is still very mind-blowing to me. Um, anyway, thank you very much for your, for your time. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Fun. Space and Things Podcast. Launching from your favorite podcast platform every Thursday. Okay, that conversation was absolutely fascinating. Um, he really blew my mind. Hearing about the eclipse predictions from not just a mathematical standpoint, but also from a historical standpoint was really uh, amazing for me because I've read a little bit about that just out of my own curiosity, you know, my own nerdy curiosity. Like, man, how did they figure, how did they figure this stuff out back then, you know? That was just a fascinating talk, and uh, the bit at the end where he talked about the Concorde, man, that made me miss Concorde, because uh, not that I could ever, not that I could afford to ever fly. <laughs> I don't have a 10 grand just lying around for a plane ticket uh, by any stretch, but I mean, he did make a point. There's no, uh, to my knowledge, there is no plane on this earth nowadays that can chase the the eclipse like that. Yeah, it was also fascinating when he was talking about um, the idea that we've got to make the most of eclipses now because in a few million years, there won't be any <laughs> because the moon would have moved right. far enough away. And and uh, <laughs> that's quite a mind-blowing experience, like thought process as well. We've got to make the most of them now, Emily, because someday in a million years, they won't, <laughs> won't be able to. So it's on our shoulders. It's yeah. on our shoulders to make sure that we look after them and, and, and enjoy them. Um, which I thought was amazing. Yeah. There was so much gold in that. That is amazing. I, that went places I did not exactly. expect 
an interview to go. We're talking about Archimedes yeah. being a computer computer manufacturer in Greece, and uh, and Newton. Yeah, Newton, all makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, and Newton not getting his uh, computations right. I just loved it. I, uh, yeah. so much, so much cool stuff there. And, and ultimately, yeah. what is time? I, I know you know you watch things like. Um, what's that movie that Christopher Nolan made? Interstellar. Like we know, yeah, we, we know that time is crazy. We live in a time. Oh, pardon the pun. We live in a, an era where, <laughs> because of our smartphones, time is so precise for us in our yeah. in our relative world. We all know exactly when things are. And I love that story at the end about how in 1991 they all went to watch an eclipse and none of them had an accurate way of telling the time. Yeah. No smartphones. Yeah, absolutely. And you had the smartest people there yeah. all who could predict an eclipse to an accurate time. <laughs> no one no Nobody one had, had a good timepiece. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because watches are not, hand-wound watches are not accurate. Yeah. They're as accurate as the VCR. Yeah, you absolutely. You probably set them up. <laughs> Back in the old days, yeah, you had a, v- a, a VCR, and the VCR you had to set it from like your wall clock. I mean, oh my god, it sounds so ancient, but it's like I remember that stuff back in the day where you had, yeah, you had the VCR, and like every time there was a power outage, it'd just be like you can't see it; it'd just be flickering. Yeah, that's how that's how I know I've had a power cut here. My microwave's flicking. I'm like, oh yeah, there's been a power cut today. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So yeah, that was a great interview. Uh, I, we're very lucky to have spoken to someone like Stephen. What a great yes. guest he was. So uh, Yeah, and he's, uh, I'm not saying this, I'm sorry to talk over you, Dave. I'm not saying this to be butt kissy. This guy is a legend in the mathematical and the computational world. So we're really, uh, I'm really thrilled that we got him on the show. This is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I think one other thing that I want to bring up that, that really struck me is that, uh, um, when these events happen, it really does just make me really remember how small we are. Uh, this is something that's been inevitable for millions of years, this eclipse, you know, the, the exact alignment um, that, that's about to happen. And when we're talking about how the moon will one day be moving far enough away that it will stop orbiting the Earth and, and, and how as we move around the solar system, uh, time is going to be incredibly hard to figure out. You, you can't just help but feel a little bit staggered. You know, we're here on this planet for such a small amount of time and all these bigger events that are set over such a longer time frame than we can ever even get our heads around are taking place. Uh, I know that some people probably find the thought of that quite depressing, but for me, I quite it quite inspiring. Uh, I'm here now and there's all this beauty around me today. You know, what luck. Uh, anyway, that's a whole different rant and podcast, I guess. But if you want to know more about Stephen and his work, please check out the show notes. Emily was correct earlier. We were extremely lucky to speak to such a giant of the scientific and mathematical and computational world as Stephen. So thank you again, Stephen, for your time. You're listening to the Space and Things podcast. So, Emily, what has caught your eye in Spaceflight this week? This is an article that I have from The Guardian. Ooh. It's called, uh, yeah, the British, British. British paper. Yeah. Yeah. Must Moon's- be bad. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's, it, I, I'm not going to mention any of y'all's other papers, but this, I think The Guardian is a pretty decent uh, source. Uh, Moon Standard Time, NASA to create lunar-centric time reference system. Uh, a memo sent on Tuesday... From the head of the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, has asked the space agency to work with other U.S. agencies and international agencies to establish a moon-centric time reference system. NASA has until the end of 2026, what a deadline, to set up <laughs> what is being called Coordinated Lunar Time or LTC. Very relevant g- given what Stephen has just talked about with all the all the time. What is time? How do you determine what time is in various parts of the of the solar system and so on and so forth? That's yeah. crazy, isn't it? What timing? Yeah. Um so the moon might have time zones, which is really <laughs> weird to me. Like like how are how are they gonna do that? Because um I'll be real, I'm still working out Earth time zone. So, yeah. um, especially some of the weird ones around Australia, the half time zones, oh, I'm still working those out. Uh, I can't wait till they figure this out. That's all I got to say. That, that's really fascinating. But if you want to read more, we do have the article in the show notes. Yeah. That's, so, that uh, cool. Dave, what has caught your eye this week? 
Yeah, I just wanted to bring people's attention to the fact, we should have mentioned this last week, but I just want to bring men- bring people's attention to the fact we have the final Delta Four Heavy Rocket about yes. to be launched. It was supposed to happen over the weekend, but uh, it got okay. scrubbed. I think it got scrubbed because of an issue with a pneumatic pump, but the weather wasn't, but wasn't the weather wasn't, wasn't really great. Yep, it's the 16th and final Delta IV heavy mission, uh, as well as the last for the Delta rocket family, which has been flying for more than six decades. Yep. This really is the end of an era, isn't it? It is. United Launch Alliance have been running the Delta program now since uh, since they they formed. Um, and it's going to be replaced by the Vulcan Centaur, which obviously we spoke about last year. Uh, it's a new rocket, which had a wonderful first flight in January. Oh, yeah. And of course, we did talk about that a lot at the time. So it's scheduled now to try again on the 9th. Uh, but the last of the Delta rockets to fly, these these really have been the workhorse of uh, American rocket deliver- uh, satellite delivery and payload delivery for many, many years, haven't they? Oh, yeah. I'm very lucky to have seen a few Delta IV uh, heavy launches, a couple of them. I saw EFT-1, and I saw, uh, I think, Parker Solar Probe. I was a little ways away for that, but I did see it. It was it was really cool. I, I've seen a few regular, I, I say regular, because Delta IV <laughs> heavy is such a behemoth. Like, it doesn't look like it's from this planet, honestly, yeah. when it launches. But I've seen a few regular Delta launches from other Delta rockets, obviously, in the last... 40 something years, you know, because it's always been around. It, it's, it's like you said, it's been around for, I think, 63 years or something wild like that. And um, now it's being retired. So I am very, I am very sad about that. Um, but, you know, I'm excited for the future. Um, like you said, there's the Vulcan Centaur, which really just rocked its debut. I mean, it, it I, I saw the Vulcan Centaur launch and it was just, not a flaw detected. I mean, it was just like, wow, perfectly yeah. just mwah, smooth. Nothing wrong. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. So, yeah, that's what's replacing the Delta family. So At least it's being replaced with something, isn't it? Because sometimes things get cancelled and there's no nothing lined up. Whereas, there's nothing. That, whereas this is, you know, it's being cancelled because we've got a replacement. It's already operational. It's a good story, isn't it? You know, it's about yeah. time the Delta's got re- retired in many ways, old technology, so on and so forth. Let's bring it up to date. But that doesn't mean we can't yep. can't be sad about the fact it's the end of an era. Exactly. We're not going to be able to see it anymore. We're, you know, it's like when the Titans got re- or replaced. I, I shouldn't say replaced. When the Titans were discontinued, I think yep. in the early 2000s, I, I've seen a few Titan launches from like across the state. You know, I never got to see one up close, which I regret. I understand why they were retired, but at the same time, I'm like nostalgic, you know, yeah. and I feel like we're going to have kind of the same thing going on where, man, I would love to see one of those again someday. I've been saving up parts, Lego parts, to build myself a Lego Delta IV Heavy. I've nearly got them all. So, yeah, there's a there's a set that I've seen that I'm, I'm like, yes, I'm going to gonna do that because I would like to have yeah. that in my Lego rocket garden. So. If you're, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to have a rocket in your Lego rocket garden, that's a really great it's one. A good one uh, yeah, like I absolutely. said... I've seen a couple of those uh, launches more up close. Uh, I've seen a few of them further away, but I've seen a few of them up close, and they're just friggin'. It's like something from another planet. Their launch, uh, the profile is just so alien looking to me. Yeah. It's got the you know the center core and the two enormous side boosters. It is just incredible, and it looks like it's on fire as well, doesn't it? When it <laughs> when that cl- clock reaches zero, like hang on a moment, is, is that? Is that how it's supposed to look? <laughs> the first time I saw um, the first Delta Four Heavy launch I saw was EFT-1, the Orion launch yeah. in 2014. And when I remember when it lit off, I'm like, why is it doing that? Why is it? <laughs> and my friends are like, my friends are like, that's normal. That's what it, it sets itself on fire before it leaves. It's like, <laughs> it's like me when I get angry or something like it, it just sets itself on fire and then it leaves. <laughs> it just leaves the house. But. Seriously, no. On a serious note, I remember watching it, uh, I would say about a good 15 seconds before it actually leaves, or before it actually lifts off the pad. It's on fire. There's like flames licking the side of the rocket. It looks like nothing else. It's incredible. <laughs> I-, I hope that some of you uh, can come out and actually see the last one. I really do. I Because it, it's like nothing on Earth. And I am sad it's going to be retired, but... If this is any consolation to you, at least now we have 
YouTube and you know, there's yeah, plenty of, of <laughs> yeah, you can, I mean, I know it's not, it's not remotely the same. I hate saying that because people are always like, go watch Saturn five launches on YouTube. And it's, it's cool, but it's not like the real thing you want to, you know, but it's there, you can see it. Um, and there's some pretty good, uh, I think ULA has some pretty good, uh, Delta four heavy launch videos on there for your enjoyment. So if you want to see them, they're there. Well, links to articles about the things we've discussed will be in the show notes. You can find the show notes on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, <laughs> or by clicking a link in the description of this episode in your podcast provider. That's it for this week. We really appreciate you listening and your support. Thank you once again to our Patreon supporters. Uh, you really do make our lives better, so that's mm-hmm. very nice of you. Um, if anyone else would like to join, head to patreon.com slash spaceandthings. That was a very English phrase, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It's so, very, so very nice of you. That's so very nice of you. Yeah, it sounded kind of weird coming out of my mouth. Oh, yeah. It really did. It felt, it felt, it didn't feel right. I said something the other day to Steve, I forgot my husband, and he was like, have you been hanging out with Dave way too much lately? Because it was just very British. It was very British, you know, very, very British sounding. And Steve was like, that is very British. And I'm like, oh, God. So, yeah. Amazing. Go on, well, Dave. I'm well, sorry. That's very, that's very nice of you, anyway. So, thank you to all who share the podcast with your space fight loving friends. This episode might be one of those which is very useful to share this week with all the eclipse info, but that's up to you, of course. Thanks for getting all the way to the end of this episode. And don't forget, in space, no one can hear you stream. Thanks for listening to the Space and Things podcast. Back next Thursday with a brand new episode.